Hello, my name is Dubs Weinblatt. My pronouns are they, them, theirs, and I'm the Associate Director of Education and Training for Metro New York for Keshet. I am thrilled to be the host of Keshet's virtual series, Joy and Resilience, Jewish LGBTQ Leaders on What Sustains Us. As LGBTQ Jewish people, oftentimes we need to create our own ways of persevering through tough moments. Surviving and thriving in this world has pushed us to create our own store of unique wisdom about resilience, joy, and community. Each week, our team will invite a different Jewish LGBTQ community leader to join us in a thoughtful conversation about what sustains us and keeps us hopeful. With me today is my colleague, Randy Reed, who will introduce our guest. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Dub said, my name is Randy Reed. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the Bay Area Education and Training Manager for Keshet. And we are so thrilled to have Rabbi Amichai Lau Levi join us today. And I am so honored uh, to tell you a little bit about him. Rabbi Amichai Lau Levi is the founding spiritual leader of Lab Shul NYC and the creator of Storytelling Inc. In 2016, the forward named him one of the 30 most inspiring rabbis in America. And in 2017, he was top five on the Forward 50, their annual list of the most influential and accomplished Jews in America. Welcome again, Amichai. As Dub mentions earlier, our conversation series is about joy and resilience. So tell us, what do those words mean to you and how do they intersect? Thank you for having me on your yeah. Joy and Resilience TV show. <laughs> We're uh, happy to have it's you. an honor. This is really an honor. Um, you know, that was my sort of for my formal uh, bio. My queer bio is that first of all, Keshet and I go back to when Keshet got started and Edith Klein and I were like wannabes. So it's such an honor to be back with the Keshet family after all these beautiful years of getting wiser and deeper and bigger and holding. Um, and um, it's an opportunity and a privilege to be reflecting on this moment with you all um, in, the, in the queer family, mm -hmm. in its wholeness. Uh, so joy and resilience. Uh, this is giving me joy, connection. I know we're all screened and zoomed out. But uh, when connections happen, and it's not just, uh, uh, but hey, hello, here's your heart, here's mine, something's happening, and that mm -hmm. happens in multiple ways. <sighs> Beauty. So I'm sitting in my garden, I'm so lucky. And um, the honeysuckle there is beginning to pop up, and the um, squash that I planted from seed back in March is coming out. And... So I've been doing a little gardening and that's just like little moments of joy. And what I also, I think I'm learning that joy just kind of happens, it comes. My job is to work on happiness, which means to be a little less grumpy, to not look at what isn't, but look at what is. Constantly I go back to is. And in Hebrew, the word is yesh, is, yesh. Which is very similar to the English yes. So focusing on what oh, I wish, oh, FOMO, okay, yes, true. What's here now? The honeysuckle, okay. So it's a lot of self-training. I'm here alone uh, in Harlem, in my home, very privileged and lucky, and yet home alone, 70 days. So resilience, if I'm working on the happiness to be in joy, resilience is the art of like bouncing back quickly. I think that's like actually in the dictionary thing about what resilience is. It's something about bouncing back quickly. Um, and being able to be, especially in, this, in, in crisis, like return to center. Um, I've been meditating a lot for many, many years. And um, sometimes on, sometimes off. I took some meditation retreats over the years. It's integrated into my spiritual work privately and at Lab Shul and other places where I hold sacred space. Take a breath, go inside, right? We've all done it 80 times today alone. And like all things wise and beautiful, it's right here as a major method for really cultivating and retaining resilience. 
I do find in comparing it with so many different people from all different paths, religious, not religious, Jewish, queer, Buddhist, combos, my witch circles. We're learning how to use the art of alignment. Um, Andrew Raymer, I don't know if you know him, who's a gay elder in um, Oakland. Might know him, uh, Randy. He was like, back when I was coming out in the 90s, uh, in my in my twenties, uh, this book came out called Gay Soul. Mm-hmm. It was just a lot of of gay men talking about soul, and I was like, "What? You can do that?" <sighs> I was just coming out of orthodoxy, and Andrew Raymer, who at the time was like a, a raging Buddhist, as he said, wrote this beautiful piece about queer and and eros and soul and spirit and meditation. And I remember I lived in Jerusalem. I like hallowed that book. He's become a dear teacher and friend over the years. Now he's big on Jew too. And um, he and I were talking a couple of weeks ago. I reached out to him to see how he's doing his home alone. Oakland and like many, he's lived through HIV and he's been an elder in our queer tribe. And he's talked about alignment. And so that thing you call meditation, y'all, alignment. It's such a lovely word for this practice. And if you are versed in any way of that multi-human practice, it is about watching your breath. You're going to watch yourself get lost in anxiety about the past and the future. And you're coming back to right now, kindly to your breath, to this nanosecond. That's resilience. It's gently coming back. All we can do is like watch ourselves mess up. In a zillion ways in which FOMO is the least of our sins. And then bring yourself to here and now. So here I am endorsing with alignment. I'm using an app every morning. I'm sitting in the afternoon. I'm teaching my 10 year old, my 11 year old son on FaceTime in the morning how to meditate. And then we work out. So join resilience. It's about choice to do it, to be in the is and not in the, in the not. And I don't want to be Pollyanna, but I'm finding that all these spiritual teachings are really great. And the birds, are you hearing the birds? Just yeah. Them, right? Mm-hmm. I hear the birds yeah. and I hear the train and it, it makes, that brings me joy to hear the train. Um, welcome, welcome from the Metro North. It's still functioning here. I used to, I used to live in New York. So it's, that brings back some, some good memories. So I do like to find the small things or the little things that bring us joy. And yeah. that can in turn give us some resilience and really going back to um, those divine pieces. Or I, what I always say is like our, our divine spark that's in us, there's also divine sparks everywhere. Mm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I love the idea of, um, of resilience and joy being choices um, that we are making for ourselves. Um, so it takes work. I think it could, it takes work to find joy, especially in hard moments. Um, and if we are making it, you know, being intentional about choosing to find it when we're able, uh, I think that's really powerful. Um, and so I'm wondering there's, you and I had a kind of like a pre conversation and we talked about a lot of different things and something that I was really excited to bring into the space with you is this idea of self-reliance and self-resilience and tools for handling really hard moments. And we are all in a very hard moment right now. And so I'm wondering where, where did you learn these tools um, to be able to return to yourself and to return and to make those choices? Thank you. Um, when I was 16 years old and I was really just coming out and I was in an Orthodox boys yeshiva on, not far from me actually, at the YU, I had an English teacher by the name of Miss Mayevsky, Miss Pearl Mayevsky. She was an, a, a, a legend at her time. She must have been in her 60s at the time. Um, she was an English literature teacher which was not highly valued in the yeshiva. I effing loved it. Mm. And she, I remember, got us how to teach the very first uh, 
week, she's like, nobody used the word nice in any of my essays. You take that word nice, you wrap it up with pink ribbons and you throw it to the East River. That's a lazy <laughs> adjective. It's like, yeah. So she taught us Emerson and this, this essay, Self-Reliance. And I was 16 and I was like, oh, wow, people are thinking about this shit. And, and like literature and like English, like she gave me my love of, of being the book nerd that I am. Um, so I think self-reliance, um, so it comes from finding the avenues into what's out there to give you tools, the scaffolding. I, I actually pulled up a quote from, from Emerson. He's on my shelf. Um, not that I memorized any of them, but he says, nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Mm-hmm. So I'm 51, I'm single, I'm Jewish, I'm a rabbi, I'm an Abba of three children, I'm a friend to many. I'm invested in the well-being of many people who are invested in mine. And right now my job for the last two months is holding a lot of space for a lot of people. And trying to create places where we, you know, we call what we do soul fuel stations. Just, right, we're not the first responders. It's not about the body, but it's about the body. It's about mm-hmm. our mental and soulful body. But if I don't have peace inside, then I'm useless. And the same for all of us, no matter what we're doing. So there are tools for that. And that's where the self-reliance come in. I can't rely on anyone to make me feel good or to do my morning practice or to work out. That's going to make me feel good. Do it. And it sounds stupid, right? But like we've got a thousand voices in our head that prevent us from doing what we want to do for any number of decent reasons. I think that my... Queer, our queerness in some way sets us up for success. A lot of us have had to make tough choices. We had to come out of closets and homes and abusive homes. And we'll talk about what's happening now, what we're concerned about. But like to make a choice that says, this is about me, you know, whether it's, mm-hmm. you know, Gaga is your soundtrack or whatever the hell I had back when, but um, Bronsky B, um, for sure. Yeah, we already had to say, nothing can bring you peace but yourself. And we had to say, excuse me, thank you to a lot of voices in our head and outside that did not allow us to take care of ourselves. And as, a, and as an LGBTQ community with these decades of fights and so much more, we're like, oh yeah, we know how to take care of ourselves. So we got to internalize that, both as individuals and as a community. That's what self-reliance is. Lord knows the federal and the whatever, whoa, y'all. Bundle up. Yeah. How do you? And, and I just want to share. I just want to share one little story more about that. Yeah. Because as I was thinking about the Emerson quote, so I want to bring here my um, my beloved um, a former lover, who passed away two years ago, from HIV related, and he was a wise uh, wise shaman. We met at the Radical Fairies and together for like five years, <laughs> and. Um, and we went to a bar one night shortly uh, into our relationship and I was checking out some guy and he wasn't checking me out. And I was like, Rrr. and I walked out all grumpy and sweet pie, blessed be his memory said to me, isn't it crazy how we let totally strange, total strangers dictate our happiness. Mm. It was like one of those like hour long conversations on the sidewalk outside the bar, he and I, but, and I remembered his wise words in many occasions in this one that, we got to learn how to be our own self-lovers yeah. and take care of ourselves. And, um, and there are ways for doing that. We're so lucky to have inherited so many tools, queer tools, Jewish tools, spiritual tools, makeup being the least of it. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. My, I, my eyes are tearing because uh, that's mm. such a... Uh, that's, it's beautiful. And um, I'm going to cry, sorry. Um, um, so I'm wondering, um, you said uh, earlier, there are so many voices and we have to learn to listen. How do you, how does one, how do you discern the voice that we should be listening to? Because it, I feel like it can feel really challenging sometimes um, to, to know what's true and like which choice to make. And I'm wondering if there's Te- any teachings in the Torah or teachings that you've learned along the way or um, or any 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 kind of thoughts around that mm, wow mm. 
this is too short a like too small a canvas for me to get all queer theology so we can have like a ps late at night but okay <laughs> part of what's been really helpful to me these past months through quietening and not letting the fear take over like less fear and more love totally the cliche like let fear like shh, okay is nature is mother nature is the notion of the divine sparks that you talked about randy mm -hmm. energy ecosystem mother earth gaia planet right like we're in the middle of a pandemic that is mother earth universal goddess all of us saying hello we are interconnected remember and what you do impacts what I do and how you're feeling has to do with what I'm feeling and it's like not just about intersectionality it's like interconnectedness it's like there's nothing else mm -hmm. some of us are hearing it more than others some of us on the fringe and in the margins who've known about being on the sides in various ways and for some of us it's way worse than for others no question mm -hmm. right now that's like hello in the faith communities and all of its breath i hear a lot of people asking like are you are you are you hearing what i'm hearing like she's speaking they're speaking it is speaking and there are prophetic formulas for these moments a lot of them are patriarchal and binary and partial, so they're not as helpful. But all of them are sitting on the older human wisdom of like what to do when crisis happens and how it's always an opportunity for creative challenge. Um, so not being in fear and going into love, trusting whatever this nature thing is here, not taking it personally. You know, this tree over here uh, was like, no leaves over the winter. And I was here when it started, there were no leaves. I'm like, oh, the cherry tree. And then slowly, slowly, and then I noticed that I'm no farmer, but I was like, you know what? There's all these branches where the green leaves are not coming up. So I started pruning. I figured out the dead old ones that don't have leaves a month into leaves, are like, I'm going to prune. And I think it did great to the tree. Fruits already coming out. And wow. it's, so as I was doing it, I was thinking, that's what Earth is doing right now. She's pruning. Don't take it personal. We are one species among many. We have to learn how to collab, you know, ecosystemize and collaborate. And we have to work as people in our communities to really take this interconnected into responsibility to each other seriously. But we're all screwed. Mm -hmm. So whatever my divine, spiritual, God conversation, it's a lot about my own breath and spirit and inside and being attuned to a nature that is the closest I'm comfortable talking about God since my lab shoot is God optional. Mm -hmm. That was a detour, but I hope it was. That was beautiful. Okay, thank you. I, I'm yeah. riffing. Yeah, and that's all, that's yeah. all we're all doing right now, right? I was gonna say, we're, we're here for that. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. As, you, as you're talking about your garden and everything. That's one of my kind of meditative practices that I've been doing since this kind of shelter in place has happened is I go outside and make sure that my garden is healthy and thriving. And, you know, my, my partner says, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm talking to the trees, leave me be because we need that moment. And one of the things I've said about the Bay Area compared to New York is that the Bay Area has hummingbirds and New York has lightning bugs, which are two incredible magical beings that you have to be still and be in the moment to actually catch them. And that is, is everything you were just saying. I was like, oh yeah. Is lightning bugs the same as fireflies? Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, lightning bugs is such a cuter name. Uh, I know, it's like, it's coming soon. I was like, wait, I, I wonder if they'll come back here. I'll have to go, oh, they'll have to go find them like in the that's, park. Yeah. I'm inviting them. Yes, bring them, bring them. They're lovely. Yeah, I, think, I mean, and it's sexy. I'm like, ooh, that? yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can deal with some bug sex right now. 
That's pretty cute. Bring it on. I got to get it. Bring it on. (laughs) Eroticize it. Um, I feel like I've been asking all the questions. Rainy, do you want to? I I do. Um, Yeah. And I'm I'm gonna go off on one tangent really quick because I just love the the little connections that I'm learning more and more about you. I mean, hi, I grew up in Southern Oregon as well, so I know the fairy community and mm. quite a few people. So you said that. Yay. Now. Oh, so much so much joy. Yeah. Um. As we talk about joy and all the things that are kind of bringing us um, somewhat grounding, some of us are finding it. How have you seen um, or what have you observed of how the times we're living in right now are impacting the queer community? What have you seen? Well, yeah. So first of all, I'll say that I, you know, in this um, various ways, there's an Olympics of suffering going on. Um, So I'll say for myself, I'm not great being alone, but I realize how extremely privileged I am to be with everything I need in a beautiful home and a garden with the immediate to me and to my family, healthy and a paycheck, at least for now, making sure I'm here. And for many, many in my community, the Jewish community, the fairy community, the queer community, the refugee community, people I'm in touch daily, that's not the case. And I think um, we talked about intersectionality and certainly in the queer community, we know that there's a lot of intersectional vulnerability. A lot of our families all over, sure on the West Coast, I know in the city, all over, it's like, whoa, a lot of gig economy, a lot of restaurant work, a lot of of stuff that's not happening right now. So I think like all on the planet, but for our community at large, this is, whoa. And I'm, I'm noticing that from conversations and, and, and requests for help. Mm-hmm. Very real. Um, I posted um, in one of the sort of queer spiritual sites that I probably would never have joined had it not been for COVID, but I did mm-hmm. two months ago and I'm a little judgmental, but mostly I'm very, very inspired and interested in like having this conversation globally. Um, it's primarily gay men, even though it's not just for gay men, but that sort of where, where, where that conversation went was interesting. And on my Facebook wall, and I got a lot of people talking and asking this question, like as people in the queer world, what are we seeing? Um, the, the, the rage and the scariness about the fault lines of where our racial class, uh, you know, everything we know about what's wrong with the system we're living in pre-Trump and during Trump is like the mirrors in our face. It's awful and the suffering is going to grow. And we need to figure out what does interconnectedness look like in a real way. A lot of people are talking about that. There's a lot of questions of intimacy. A lot of us are home alone or in relationships that are being tested and a lot of different things. And we've known closets again, and we've known what it is to like find our or we'll try to find a balance between mental and erotic and heart and soul. And this is really pushing a lot of the intimacy buttons for everybody again, but I think in the lack of a place to gather um, after we've all been talking about how all of like erotic life went online with dating and sex apps. Yes. And no, we know where the no now is. And for many of us, it's a lifeline. Literally. Mm-hmm. So, so that's this intimacy and this lifeline security in our community is huge. A lot of people I'm talking to are having HIV, AIDS flashbacks of PTSD. Mm-hmm. And even those of us who did not live there, I was a young teenager, it's like it's in our ecosystem right now. Wow, our community is reliving plague and infection and tests. And do I go out? Am I safe? It's like, oh, what can we learn from this? taking mm-hmm. care of each other and our elders and the vulnerable don't expect for them to reach out we got to reach out mm-hmm. so there's a lot of that I'm, I'm seeing a lot of uh pride month anxiety a because of the lack of these places to come together and really celebrate who we are the visibility of pride and just like 
damn, those are some good parties. <laughs> yeah. So how do we bring pride as we can? Um, I'll say that um, intimacy, the challenge of intimacy was there as a fault line like racism, many other fault lines of our reality before this. But it's like, the earth is like cracking open. You're like, look, you guys, we got to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Like this ridiculousness of the elders and the elder homes. And it's like, no, that's not how we homo sapiens were meant to be. And the, to be queer elders without the support, to be young, coming out teens in environments that don't have the tribal thing of support. We, we have stuff to fix here. Mm. So, you know, I go back to um, hesitant optimism, what Viktor Frankl wrote about, but called tragic optimism. Are you familiar with the no. term? Mm -mm. Um, so I'm, I'm freely quoting Esther Perel, um, who's a dear friend and Lab Schuler, and we do yoga together, which is super fun. And she's, I mean, amazing. Esther, like, nailing it. So she wrote a piece the other day, kind of in, uh, in response to something Masha Gessen was writing. And she, she so I just want to give you this quote from Viktor Frankl, who was a Viennese Holocaust survivor who survived Auschwitz. His manuscript came out of it, Man in Search of Meaning. And he says that tragic optimism is um, the ability to maintain hope and find meaning in crisis. The exact quote is, the human capacity to creatively turn life's negative aspects into something positive or constructive. A human capacity. So it's true for all of us, and it's part of what we talked about today, the joy and resilience, and just like saying yes, not stuck in what's not. And without being Pollyanna, and again, I think in our queer community, yeah, we got it. There's been so much creativity online. I mean, the radical fairy community, hello. Jewish queer community, queer clubs, and like, there's a lot of ability here to deal with intimacy, deal with isolation, deal with the PTSD, that would, and bring it as a gift to the world. Like, let's compost this. Just another pet project of mine, but that's for separate. Um, I am, I am, I have, I am, I'm concerned that a lot of the patterns and the fault lines continue and will continue in some ways. And then the question is, how do we have small wins and how do we take daily disciplined steps to maintain some of the goodness that we're, that we are breathing here. Mm -hmm. And um, we have so much more to do in ensuring the rights and the dignity and the justice and the safety of all and certainly our LGBTQ community. Yeah, I really like that idea of, um, well, first of all, I'm so happy to learn what tragic optimism is. Um, like I might fall and I feel like I fall into that of wanting to learn from everything. I mean, I have a tattoo of that on my arm, literally. That says learn, what does it from, say? learn from everything. Um, it. Because it's really meaningful to me to find the reason or find maybe not the reason but something terrible has happened i need to learn from this and grow from this because otherwise i'm going to get stuck in the the tragic part and i'm not going to be able to move forward and i think for me personally that that might be my like thesis of my resilience for myself is like how can i turn this really hard thing into something positive um so i'm happy to have a term for that um I also think too, when we talk about the impacts of the queer community, so often we, we go to the really hard things that we're facing, but I also want to name some good things too that are that the queer community, um, that not, not, certainly not everyone, but I know for me, I'm misgendered never. And so the, I've, I've noticed in my body and in my self, because I don't have to worry when I'm out in the streets and the subway in other buildings, I'm not, I'm not carrying that, that fear, anxiety of how many times am I going to be misgendered today? Um, I don't have to worry about where I'm going to go to the bathroom. Um, 
And am, am I going to be harassed in the bathroom? And so I've found I'm so much more comfortable in my own body and I can breathe a little bit easier. Mm. And that is certainly not something that I expected to come from this. And it's something that I'm able to name as something that's really important for me to, to notice that that's happening. Um, that's Thank you for sharing that. That's very powerful. Like the, the sense of like relaxed, relaxed embodiment. Just like, okay, here I am. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, right? I mean, we're living through this moment that we're assuming is going to be analyzed ad nauseum until the end of time, hopefully mm -hmm. a very, very long time. We're yeah. all going to come out of this at some point and, and learn and laugh. And we talked a lot about how important humor is in all this. Mm -hmm. and uh and figure out in our bodies and like okay this feels like boot camp in mm -hmm. some way and i've been through boot camp i was in the army so i was like this is like a boot camp um and it's like i'm choosing it like i'm making it in my boot camp like i get up at six in the morning i do my meditation thing i do my thing routine and i was like because if you don't do it i'll slip slack so i like mm -hmm. i need to do it and i feel like what you're saying about about just being more here, I think we're all in some kind of a boot camp. And some of us are taking it more seriously than others. Yes, mass, no, inside, outside. But it's like, and as we are privileged to be inside, outside work as necessary out there, there is, um, goes back to what, you know, the mother nature conversation. I'm, I'm sensing an invitation to take this time productively. If only to get fit, if only to be ready, you know, you all read Octavia Butler, mm -hmm. Parable of the Sower. Um, she was an African-American leader, writer, queer, sci-fi writer. And she wrote this book about the future, which is 2024. Mm. And I started reading it like two weeks before quarantine. Okay. I was like, oh my God, I can't put it down. And it's basically the worst scenario of what's going to happen out of this in four years. So basically, it's like gangs and lawlessness. Um, but from reading her very huge vision, it really is about the notion of the spiritual God is change and looking out for each other. And she makes this pods of people come together. And I think that's something I'm taking from this moment. Like the solitary and the solitude is a gift for those of us who can have it different than lonely but uh, the notion of pods and communities and how do we really 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 prioritize the mini pods that we need whatever is coming next and i hope butler was wrong um micro communities something i'm thinking a lot about with the micro communities and one of the things that i keep thinking of as as we're talking about this um you know we're finding different ways to find our joy, find our resilience, find a way to cope, <clears throat> find the humor. And Dubs, <clears throat> you and I have our own coping ways to learn from this situation. And you showed your tattoo of learn from everything. And I'm like, do I have something like that? And I'm like, oh, I have my own way of the way I deal. And it's a tattoo, but it's more humor. And I will show you. And then I'm going to ask you, Amihai, a question because it's all linked, right? So this is the this is the tattoo. Uh, love that. <laughs> That's it grounds me because that is how I can find my resilience is to find some a moment to laugh at. And if I'm in a really stressful meeting or something and I'm just I put my hand up and I go, "Oh, Randy. <laughs> you have that, but it's something really fun to kind of continue to bring to the world." And that's how I try to care for people. How do you feel in our micro communities or in our worldwide communities? How do we care for one another, even though we're separated? Um, and how do we cultivate that type of community and care and connection, even though I haven't seen my family in, and my chosen family in X amount of weeks? Yeah, um, our friend and teacher Priya Parker 
has been preaching up and down. The gatherings need to continue. You just got to be creative about it. Figure out who's, you know, who, who are the people you want to cultivate. They'll be different. I think some of the things we're learning this time is about essence. What is the essence that I need to do right? Like, what's, how am I efficient at being me? And that means that some of the things that seems less essential in this place where essential workers are so essential sort of drops off. So there are some people who, you know, and I haven't spoken to in a month or two or more. I'm, I'm sure we'll talk again, not essential. The ones who it's sort of like survival of the fittest in my evolutionary emotional ecosystem, it's like, okay, invest, pay attention. There's a couple of groups that, you know, I meet with, this, we, we have this sort of queer aging group that we started two years ago, a bunch of people thinking about, you know, we're all in our 50s, 40s, 50s. Uh, so Friday, 6 p.m. for like a half hour, we like do kind of pre-Shabbat, not the whole group's Jewish, but that's a check-in, right? There's a couple of others. And I, um, I reach out every Friday. We have a, at Labs, we have a phone tree for partners in the community. And like, you, you get, you pass, you're free, you know? And it's like, it's forging, it's forging relationships. I mean, I'm, I'm seeing it. Um, I also will say that I, I too am asking that question. I mean, I provide a lot in my rabbinic role and um, I've been a little, I've had zero patience for the first six weeks to think anything dating wise or thing. I was just like, goodbye everybody. Mm -hmm. and now it's been two months later and I'm like, hello, it's summer. <laughs> how do we negotiate? Like, how is this happening? Where do we go? How do we make it? So, but, you know, so everyone's like, how do we figure out? Something about trust, intuition, small groups, micro communities, yeah. pods, consciously creating them in some way. And, and I'll say, and in some ways in the months and year ahead, I wanna say we're gonna need these ritual containers for, 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 for processing our trauma and for mm -hmm. holding each other and for coming out of this. Because if we're gonna have post-traumatic growth, which we must, we're gonna learn how to hold each other whatever the small group, if it's the AA model, the minion model, the yeah. piano bar model, the, you know, check. mini pots. Not that I have any, you know, it's just like, I, I mean, I know, that's really what's always worked. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. part of a lot of what I know we're all encountering I know I have is a lot of mourning, a lot of Kaddish, Zoom shivas and funerals. And, um, and then again, regardless of, of how we affiliate or who we are, but um, I led one shiva for a, an elder queer person who died alone and really had no family. So mm. a few friends organized the Shiva vigil. But how powerful that was, mm. that mini pod. Mm -hmm. And how Kaddish, which is a funny thing, is still a powerful poem of, and Minyan, the notion of 10 people coming together, because that's what we do, right? That's ancient technology, the, the train thing. It's, a, it's connection. Mm -hmm. So we're learning a lot about what that looks like online. like. Shul online, dating online, minion online, dinner online, dance parties online, drag shows online, therapy online. Hopefully not for long, but for now, yes. How do we compost the best out of it as well? Yeah. Amichai, what gives you hope? Poetry gives me hope. Um, history gives me hope. Learning from the past about how a lot of humans in a lot of moments and sometimes societies went through the spiral of life by really contracting and then expanding. We're in a contraction, we're in a historical moment of proportions we might not even know the beginning of yet. 
and yet the same human tools that our ancestors had, whether it's how my father survived Buchenwald and how, you know, Noah's family and zoo survived the flood and how our queer ancestry has been through so much and only now really learning to say, here we are. Here's what we learned from history. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've been some powerful witches. A lot of queer truth to power over the centuries. We, we have a role here. Uh, that gives me hope. I will say I was going to bring to y'all my, my sort of Zoom drag show in the making. Mm. Um, but it's like so kind of still on the half potato thing. But my favorite poet is Leah Goldberg, the Israeli poet. And um, so I got a shower cap and the type of sunglasses she would have worn in the 60s. She was a chain smoker. I bought a pack just for that. And I have, and lipstick. And I wanted us to do her in the bath, just mm. reading, like reading her obscure poems that I love in Hebrew. I fully support that. Music. Right, I hereby um, on I national television <laughs> just did it. So, I mean, so that's I... giving me hope, because it's like dumb and like so cute. And she was amazing and she was very lonely actually. I really. She, she kind of died alone of, of TB or something. So mm. I want to bring her with humor. You know, my, my, my drag career, you all know about it so many years ago, Hadassah Gross's history. But she, she, she gave me hope because she was like a way to bring dark humor into whatever moments and in heels. So she's retired, but maybe I'll bring back the shower cap. And that go her. Yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned. If Keshet wants to produce it. I mean... <laughs> Maybe. We'll talk. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, we'll talk. Your know, people can talk to my <laughs> Deal. Deal. Amichai, thank you for sharing that. Um, and to, to kind of end our session today, um, we're going to ask you a series of just silly questions um, right. with the, the intention that you respond in quick fashion and, you know, no pressure, no big deal. Are you uh -huh. ready? Okay. All right. Big deep breath. What's your favorite food? Mango. What's one piece of advice you'd give to your younger self? Work out more often. If you could choose another profession, what would it be? Gardener, florist, possibly. If you had a pet elephant, what would you name it? Gaia. What word do you love? Infatuate. Oh, good one. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Amichai, thank you so much for joining us today and for sharing with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you, my friends. I'm delighted to be in conversation with Kesha, with you, Dubs. It's been fun to get to know and I look forward to more journeys together. And mm -hmm. thank you, Randy, for coming to visit me back in New York and me with you out there, Wes, yes. and to the Keshet family, really, let's uh, keep holding the rainbow I and brightening that. it. Yeah. And uh, I'm, yeah, so yesterday was rainbow day, you know, like when the ark landed. Um, I know this will be also screened at the, at the lab shul all nighter, so I'm delighted to be revealing all these thoughts with you. And yeah. Thank you for, for joining us in that conversation. And I hope this is helpful to people. And if anyone needs or wants to reach out and have a conversation about this queer spiritual stuff, sure. And we'll talk about the drag show. <laughs> Amazing. Um, have a lovely day. You wow. too. Thank you. And thank you for everyone who's, who's watching or listening. And um, don't forget to visit us at www.keshetonline.org to check out our resources, videos, and information about Keshet and to support our work towards full LGBTQ equality in Jewish life. And stay tuned for next week's episode.